Hey guys, I'm going to do the week two reading. So I'm Mrs. Laurenti. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. So unit two is on cells. Cells are everywhere. Even though most can't be seen with the naked eye, they make up every living thing. Your body alone contains trillions of cells. In this unit, you will learn about cells. You will learn the difference between animal cells, plant cells, and bacterial cells. You'll learn about the different parts of a cell and how they work together. Cells were discovered in 1665, and since then we've learned a lot about cells and the way they work. The timeline to the right of the page shows some of the discoveries that have been made along the way, but there's still a lot to learn about the fascinating world of cells. So chapter three, cells, the basic unit of life. So now I'm on page 54. Trim off. Okay, page 54, chapter three, cells, the basic units of life. What if? Imagine this scene from a horror film. A young man sits down to dinner to find that his mother has made asparagus again. The young man eats the dreaded asparagus stalks. Later, he finds out that instead of being digested, one of the stalks has taken up residence inside his body and is very much alive. Too horrifying to think about. What if the asparagus began to do wonderful things for the young man, such as giving him more energy than he ever dreamed possible? Lynn Margulis, a scientist, thinks that something similar may have happened to certain one-celled organisms that lived more than a billion years ago, giving rise to the kinds of cells we are made of today. According to Margulis' theory, about 1.2 billion years ago, some larger cells began eating smaller cells for dinner. Like the white blood cell on this page, the larger cells trap the smaller cells with extensions of their cell body. But some of these smaller cells resisted being digested. In fact, they began to do very well in their new homes. The larger cells also benefited from their new guests. The smaller cells released large amounts of energy from food taken by the larger cells. Other kinds of small cells used the energy in sunlight to make enough food to feed themselves and the larger cell. The energy producing structures of most cells, including yours, are thought to have descended from these smaller cells. In this chapter, you will learn more about cells and their structures. So over on page 55, it says, what do you think? In your sciencelog.com, try to answer the following questions based on what you already know. What is a cell and where are cells found? Why are there cells and why are they so small? We're going to skip this investigate because I don't think a lot of you have a microscope at home, but if we were at school, we'd be doing page 55. So I'm gonna skip page 55 for right now. Page 56. Page 56 starts with organization of life. So some ter terms to learn are tissue, organ, organ system, organism, lots of organ in there, unicellular, multicellular, population, community, and ecosystem. So organization of life. Imagine that you're going on a trip to Mars, which we have imagined in class a lot of times. In your suitcase, you should pack everything you'll need in order to survive. What would you pack? To start, you'd need food, oxygen, and water. And that's just the beginning. You would probably need a pretty big suitcase, wouldn't you? Actually, you have all of those items inside your body's cells. A cell is smaller than the period at the end of this sentence, yet a single cell has all the items necessary to carry out life's activities. Every living cell, every living thing has at least one cell. Many living things exist as a single cell, while others have trillions of cells. To get an idea of what a living thing with nearly 100 trillion cells looks like, just look in the mirror. Cells, starting out small. Most cells are too small to be seen without a microscope but you might have one of the world's largest cells in your refrigerator. To find out what it is, look on the left of the page, figure one. The first cell of a chicken is yellow with a tiny white dot in it, and it is surrounded by clear jelly-like fluid called egg white. The white dot divides over and over to form a chick. The yellow dot, or the yellow yolk from the first cell, and the egg white provide nutrients for the developing chick's cells. Like a chicken, you too began as a single egg cell. 
look at figure two, so that bottom picture on there, to see some of the early stages of your development. Not all of your cells look or act the same. You have about 200 different kinds of cells, and each type is specialized to do a particular job. Some are bone cells, some are blood cells, and others are skin cells. When someone looks at all of those cells together, they see you. Over on page 57 now. Tissues, cells working in teams. When you look closely at your clothes, you can see that the threads have been grouped together or woven to make cloth that has function. In the same way, cells are grouped together to make a tissue that has a function. The tissue is a group of cells that work together to form a specific job in the body. The material around and between the cells is also part of the tissue. Some examples of tissues in your body are shown in figure three, which is that picture just to the right. So it talks about blood, fat, and muscle cells. It's just a few types of the cells that make up the tissues in your body. Organs, teams working together. When two or more tissues work together to perform a specific job, the group of tissues is called an organ. Some examples of organs are your stomach, intestines, heart, lung, and skin. That's right, even your skin is an organ because it contains different kinds of tissues. To get a closer look, see figure four. So that picture on the bottom right is actually your skin really close up. Plants also have different kinds of tissues that work together. A leaf is a plant organ that contains tissue that traps light energy to make food. Other examples of plant organs are stems and roots. On to page 58. Page 58 starts with organ systems, a great combination. Organs work together in groups to perform particular jobs. These groups are called organ systems. Each system has a specific job to do in the body. For example, your digestive system's job is to break down food into very small particles so it can be used by all of your body's cells. Your nervous system's job is to transmit information back and forth between your brains and other parts of your body. Organ systems in plants include leaf systems, root systems, and stem systems. Your body has several organ systems. The digestive system is shown in figure five, so that picture below. Each organ in the digestive system has a job to do. A particular organ is able to do its job because of the different tissues within it. The organs in an organ system depend on each other. If any part of the system fails, the whole system is affected and failure of one organ system can affect other organ systems. Just think of what would happen if your digestive system stopped converting food to energy. None of the other organ systems would have energy to function. Page 59. Organisms, independent living. Anything that can live on its own is called an organism. All organisms are made up of at least one cell. If a single cell is living on its own, it is called a unicellular organism. Most unicellular organisms are so small that you need a microscope to see them. Some different kinds of unicellular organisms are shown in figure six. You are a multicellular organism. This means that you can only exist as a group of cells and that most of your cells can survive only if they remain a part of your body. When you fall down on a sidewalk and scrape your knee, the cells you leave behind on the sidewalk are not able to live on their own. Figure seven shows how your cells work together to make a multicellular organism. So there you have heart muscle cells that make up the heart muscle tissue. Together those make up the heart. And the heart is one of the many things that kind of make up you. On the bottom there is the big picture. Although unicellular organisms and multicellular organisms can live on their own, they usually do not live alone. Organisms interact with each other in many different ways. Populations. A group of organisms that are of the same kind and live in the same area make up a population. All the ladybird beetles living in the forest shown in figure eight make up the ladybird beetle population of that forest. All the red oak trees make up the forest red oak population. Now we're over on page 60. So it starts with communities. Two or more different populations living in the same area make up a community. The population of foxes, oak trees, lizards, flowers, and other organisms in a forest are all part of the forest community, as shown in figure nine. Your hometown is a community that includes all of the people, dogs, cats, and other organisms living there. 
One step more, we get to ecosystems. The community and all of the non-living things that affect it, such as water, soil, rocks, temperature, and light, make up an ecosystem. Ecosystems on land are called terrestrial ecosystems, and they include forests, deserts, prairies, and your own backyard. Ecosystems in water are called aquatic ecosystems, and they include rivers, ponds, lakes, oceans, and even aquariums. The community in Figure 9 lives in a terrestrial ecosystem. So here are your review questions, and these are the same questions that are on the sheet that you need to turn in. 1. Complete the following sentence. Cells are related to blank in the same way that blank are related to organ systems. 2. How do the cells of a unicellular organism differ from the cells of a multicellular organism? And three, applying concepts. Use the picture of an aquarium below to answer the following questions. A, how many different kinds of organisms are visible? B, how many populations are visible? And C, how many communities are visible? On to page 61 in section two, there's some new terms to learn over here. We have cell membrane, organelles, cytoplasm, nucleus, prokaryotic, eukaryotic, and bacteria. The discovery of cells. Most cells are so tiny that they are not visible to the naked eye. So how do we find out that cells are the basic unit of all living things? What would make someone think that a rabbit or a tree or a person is made up of tiny parts that cannot be seen? Actually, the first person to see cells was not even looking for them seeing the first cells. In 1665, a British scientist named Robert Hooke was trying to find something interesting that he could show to another scientist at a meeting. Earlier, he had built a crude microscope that allowed him to look at very tiny objects. One day, he decided to look at a thin slice of cork, a soft plant tissue found in the bark of trees, like the one shown in figure 10. To his amazement, the cork looks like, looked like hundreds of little boxes, which he described as looking like a honeycomb. He named these little boxes cells, which meant tiny rooms in Latin. Although Hooke did not realize it, these boxes were actually the outer layer of the cork cells that were left behind after the cells died. Later, he looked at thin slices of plant and saw that they too were made of tiny cells. Some of them were even filled with juice. Those were living cells. Hooke's microscope and drawing of cork cells are shown in figure 11. Hooke also used his microscope to look at feathers, fish scales, and the eye of houseflies, but he spent most of his time looking at plants and fungi. Since plant and fungal cells had walls that were easier to see, Hooke thought that cells were found only in those type of organisms and not in animals. 62. Talks about seeing cells in other life forms. In 1673, a few years after Hooke made his observations, a Dutch, mer Dutch merchant named Anton van Leeuwenhoek used one of his own handmade microscopes to get a closer look at pond scum, similar to that shown in figure 12. He was amazed to see many small creatures swimming around in the slimy ooze. He named the creatures animicules, which means little animals. Lewinhook also looked at blood he took from different animals and tartar he scraped off their teeth and his own. He observed that blood cells in fish, birds, and frogs are oval-shaped, while those in humans and dogs are flatter. He was the first person to see bacteria, and he discovered that yeasts used to make bread dough rise are actually unicellular organisms. The cell theory. After Hooke first saw the cork cells, almost two centuries passed before anyone realized that cells are present in all living things. Matthias Schleiden, a German scientist, looked at many slides of plant tissue and read about what other scientists had seen under the microscope. In 1838, he concluded that all plant parts are made of cells. The next year, Theodore Schwann, a German scientist who studied animals, stated that all animal tissues are made of cells. Not long after that, Schwann wrote the first two parts of what is now known as cell theory. All organisms are composed of one or more cells. The cell is the basic unit of life in all living things. About 20 years later, in 1858, Rudolf Virchow, a German doctor saw that cells could not develop from anything except other cells. He then wrote the third part of the cell theory. All cells come from existing cells. Over to page 63. Cell similarities. Cells come in many different 
shapes, and sizes and perform a wide variety of functions. They all have the following things in common. A cell membrane. All cells are surrounded by a cell membrane. This membrane acts as a barrier between the inside of the cell and the cell's environment. It also controls the passage of materials into and out of the cell. Figure 13 shows the outside of a cell. Hereditary material. Part of the cell theory states that all cells are made from existing cells. When new cells are made, they receive a copy of the hereditary material from the original cells. This material is DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. It controls all of the activities of a cell and contains the information needed for the cell to make new cells. Cytoplasm and organelles. All cells have chemicals and structures that enable the cell to live, grow, and reproduce. The structures are called organelles. Although all cells have organelles, they don't all have the same kind. Some organelles are surrounded by membranes, but others are not. The cell in figure 14 has membrane-covered organelles. The chemical and structures of a cell are surrounded by fluid. The fluid and almost everything in it are collectively called the cytoplasm. Small size. Almost all cells are too small to be seen with the naked eye. You're made up of about 100 trillion cells and it would take 50 of these cells just to cover up the dot on the letter I. Go to page 64. Page 64. Giant amoeba eats New York City. This is not a headline you're ever likely to see. Why not? Amoebas consist of only a single cell. Most amoebas can't even grow large enough to be seen without a microscope. That's because as a cell gets larger, it needs more food and produces more waste. Therefore, more materials must be able to move into and out of the cell through the cell membrane. So there's a surface to volume ratio. To keep up with these demands, a growing cell needs larger surface area through which to exchange materials. As the cell's volume increases, its outer surface grows too. But the volume of a cell, the amount a cell will hold, increases at a faster rate than the area of its outer surface. If the cell gets too large, its surface will have too few openings to allow enough materials in and out. To understand why the volume of a cell increases faster than its surface area, look at the table below. The surface to volume ratio is the area of a cell's outer surface in relation to its volume. The surface to volume ratio decreases as the cell size becomes larger. Increasing the number of cells but not their size maintains a high surface to volume ratio. So if we look at that table on the left when it's just one unit, it has a really large surface area. On the other side, on the far right, there are a lot of cells, so there's a lot of inside, but there's not a lot of surface that it has, so it has a lower surface area. Page 65. The benefits of being multicellular. Do you know now why you're made up of many tiny cells instead of one large cell? A single cell as big as you are would have an incredibly small surface to volume ratio. The cell could not survive because its outer surface would be too small to allow the materials it would need. Multicellular organisms grow by producing more small cells, not larger cells. The elephant in figure 15 has cells that are the same size as yours. Many kinds of cells. In addition to being able to grow larger, multicellular organisms are able to do lots of other things because they are made up of different kinds of cells. Just as there are teachers who are specialized to teach and mechanics who are specialized to work on cars, different cells are specialized to perform different jobs. A single cell cannot do all the things that many cells can do. Having many different cells that are specialized for specific jobs allows multicellular organisms to perform more functions than unicellular organisms. The different kinds of cells can form tissues and organs with different functions. People have specialized cells such as muscle cells, eye cells, and brain cells so they can walk, run, watch a movie, think, and do many other activities. If you enjoy doing many different things, be glad you're not a single cell. On the bottom there, it says apply, a pet paramecium. Imagine that you have a pet paramecium, a type of unicellular organism. In order to properly care for your pet, you have to figure out how much you need to feed it. The dimensions of your paramecium are roughly 125 by 50 by 20. If seven food molecules can enter through each square micrometer of surface every minute, how many molecules can eat in one minute? If your pet needs one food molecule per cubic micrometer of volume every minute to survive, how much would you have to feed it every minute? Good luck. Page 66 starts with the two types of cells. 
the many different kinds of cells that exist can be divided into two groups. As you have already learned, all cells have DNA. In one group, cells have a nucleus, which is a membrane-covered organelle that holds a cell's DNA. In the other group, the cell's DNA is not contained in a nucleus. Cells that do not have a nucleus are prokaryotic, and cells that have a nucleus are eukaryotic. Prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are also called bacteria. They're the world's smallest cells, and they do not have a nucleus. A prokaryotic cell's DNA is one long, circular molecule shaped sort of like a rubber band. Bacteria do not have any membrane-covered organelles, but they do have tiny, round organelles called ribosomes. These organelles work like tiny factories to make proteins. Most bacteria are covered by a hard cell wall outside a softer cell membrane. Think of the membrane pressing against the wall as an inflated balloon pressing against the inside of a glass jar. But unlike the balloon and jar, the membrane and the wall allow food and waste molecules to pass through. Figure 16 shows a generalized view of a prokaryotic cell. Bacteria are probably the first type of cells on Earth. The oldest fossils ever found are of prokaryotic cells. Scientists have estimated these fossils to be 3.5 billion years old. Page 67. Eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are more complex than prokaryotic cells. Although most eukaryotic cells are about 10 times larger than prokaryotic cells, they still have a high enough surface to volume ratio to survive. Fossil evidence suggests that eukaryotic cells first appeared about 2 billion years ago. All living things that are not bacteria are made up of one or more eukaryotic cells. This includes plants, animals, fungi, and protists. Eukaryotic cells have a nucleus and many other membrane-covered organelles. As advantage of having the cells divided in compartments is that it allows many different chemical processes to occur at the same time. A generalized eukaryotic cell is shown in figure 17. There is more DNA in eukaryotic cells than in prokaryotic cells, and it is stored in the nucleus. Instead of being circular, the DNA molecules in eukaryotic cells are linear, which means they're in a line. All eukaryotic cells have a cell membrane, and some of them have a cell wall. Those that have cell walls are found in plants, fungi, and some unicellular organisms. The tables below summarize the differences between eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. So in prokaryotic cells, there's no nucleus, there's no membrane-covered organelles, circular DNA, and bacteria. In eukaryotic cells, there's a nucleus, there's membrane-covered organelles, there's linear DNA, and there are all other cells that aren't bacteria. So there are a few questions that you'll have to answer. One, what are the three parts of the cell theory? Two, what do all cells have in common? Three, what are two advantages of being multicellular? Four, if a unicellular organism has a cell wall, ribosomes, and circular DNA, is it eukaryotic or prokaryotic? And five, applying concepts. Which has a greater surface to volume ratio, a tennis ball or a basketball? Explain your answer. What can be done to increase the sur surface to volume ratio of both? We finally made it to section three. So section three is all about eukaryotic cells. There are some terms to learn. Cell wall, ribosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, which is very fun to say, mitochondria, powerhouse of the cell, chloroplasts, Golgi complex, vesicle, vacuole, and lysosomes. So eukaryotic cells, the inside story. For a long time after the discovery of cells, scientists did not really know what cells were made of. Cells are so small that the details of their structure could not be seen until better methods of magnifying and staining were developed. We now know that cells are very complex, especially eukaryotic cells. Everything from the structure covering of the cells to the organelles inside of them performs a task that helps keep the cells alive, holding it all together. All cells have outer coverings that separate what is inside the cell from what is outside. One kind of covering, called the cell membrane, surrounds all cells. Some cells have an additional layer outside the cell membrane called the cell wall. Cell membrane. All cells are covered by a cell membrane. The job of the cell membrane is to keep the cytoplasm inside, to allow nutrients in and waste products out, and to interact with things outside the cell. In figure 18, you can see a close-up view of the cell membrane of a cell that's had its top half cut away. 
over to page 69. Cell wall. The cells of plants and algae have hard cell walls made of cellulose. The cell wall provides strength and support to the cell membrane. When too much water enters or leaves a plant cell, the cell wall can actually prevent the membranes from tearing. The strength of billions of cell walls in a plant enables a tree to stand tall and limbs to defy gravity. When you are looking at dried hay, sticks, and wooden boards, you are seeing the cell walls of dead plant cells. The cells of fungi, such as mushrooms, toadstools, mold, and yeast, have cell walls made of a chemical structure to that found in the hard coverings of insects. Figure 19 shows a cross-section of a generalized plant cell and a close-up view of the cell wall. The cell's library. The largest and most visible organelle in a eukaryotic cell is the nucleus. The word nucleus means kernel or nut. Maybe it does not look like a nut inside, a piece of candy. As you can see in figure 20, the nucleus is covered by a membrane through which material can pass. The nucleus is often been called the control center of the cell. As you know, it stores the DNA that has information on how to make all the cell's proteins. Almost every chemical reaction that is important to the cell's life involves some kind of protein. Sometimes a dark spot can be seen inside the nucleus. This spot is called the nucleolus and it looks like a small nucleus inside a big nucleus. The nucleolus stores the material that we use later to make the ribosomes in the cytoplasm. Page 70. Page 70 starts with protein factories. Proteins, the building blocks of all cells, are made up of chemicals known as amino acids. These amino acids are hooked together to make proteins of very small organelles called ribosomes. Ribosomes are the smallest but most abundant organelles. All cells have ribosomes because all cells need protein to live. Unlike most other organelles, ribosomes are not covered with a membrane. The cell's delivery system. Eukaryotic cells have an organelle called the endoplasmic reticulum. Repeat after me, endoplasmic reticulum, or ER, which is a membrane-covered compartment that makes lipids and other material for inside and outside the cell. It is also the organelle that breaks down drugs and other certain chemicals that could damage the cell. The ER is the internal delivery system of a cell. Substances in the ER can move from one place to another through its many tubular connections, sort of like cars moving through tunnels. The ER looks like a flattened stack, stacked side by side with cloth folded back and forth. Some ER may be covered with ribosomes that make its surface look rough. The proteins made at these ribosomes pass into the ER. Later, the proteins are released from the ER for use elsewhere. Over to page 71, the cell's power plant. In today's world, we use many sources of energy, such as oil, gas, and nuclear power. We need these energy to heat our homes, fuel our cars, and cook our food. Cells also need energy to function. Where do they get it? Mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. Inside all cells, Food molecules are burned, broken down, to release energy. The energy is transferred to a special molecule that the cell uses to get work done. As you learned earlier, that molecule is ATP. ATP can be made at several locations in eukaryotic cell, but most of it is produced at bean-shaped organelles called mitochondria, shown in figure 22. These organelles are surrounded by two membranes. The inner membrane, which has many folds in it, is where most of the ATP is made. Mitochondria can work only if they have oxygen. The reason you breathe air is to make sure your mitochondria have the oxygen they need to make ATP. Highly active cells, such as those in the heart and liver, may have thousands of mitochondria, while other cells may only have a few. Not down to chloroplasts. Plants and algae have an additional kind of energy converting organelle called the chloroplast, which is shown in figure 23. Chloroplasts have two membranes and structures that look like sacks of coins. Those are flattened membrane-covered sacks that contain important chemicals called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is what makes chloroplasts green. The energy of sunlight is trapped by chlorophyll and used to make sugar. This process is called photosynthesis. The sugar that is produced is used by mitochondria to make ATP, so it's kind of like their version of eating. You will learn more about photosynthesis in a later chapter. Page 72, where did they come from? Many scientists believe that mitochondria and chloroplasts originated as prokaryotic cells 
that were eaten by larger cells. Instead of being digested, the bacteria survived. Figure 24 shows how bacteria might have become the ancestors of mitochondria and chloroplasts. What evidence do scientists have that this theory is correct? The first piece of evidence is that mitochondria and chloroplasts are about the same size as bacteria. The second is that both are surrounded by two membranes. If the theory is correct, the outer membrane was created when the bacteria were engulfed by larger cells. Other evidence supports this theory. Mitochondria and chloroplasts have the same kind of ribosomes and circular DNA as bacteria. They also divide by like bacteria. The cell's packaging center. When proteins and other materials need to be processed and shipped out to a eukaryotic cell, the job goes to an organelle called the Golgi complex. This structure is named after Camillo Golgi, the Italian scientist who first identified it. The Golgi complex looks like the ER, but is located closer to the cell membrane. The Golgi complex of a cell is shown in figure 25. Lipids and proteins from the ER are delivered to the Golgi complex, where they are modified for different functions. The final products are enclosed in a piece of the Golgi complex's membrane that pinches off to form a small compartment. This compartment transports its contents to other part of the cell or outside the cell. Over to page 73. The cell's storage centers. All eukaryotic cells have membrane-covered compartments called vesicles. Some of them form when part of the membrane pinches off the ER or Golgi complex. Others are formed when parts of the cell membrane surround an object outside the cell. This is how white blood cells engulf other cells in your body, as shown in figure 26. It's pretty creepy. Vacuoles. Most plant cells have a very large membrane-covered chamber called a vacuole, as shown in figure 27. Vacuoles store waters and other liquids. Vacuoles that are full of water help support the cell. Some plant cells wilt when the vacuoles lose water. If you want crispy lettuce for a salad, all you need to do is fill up the vacuoles by leaving the lettuce in water overnight. Have you ever wondered what makes roses red and violets blue? It's a colorful liquid stored inside the vacuoles. Vacuoles also contain the juices you associate with oranges and other fruits. Some unicellular organisms that live in freshwater environments have a problem with too much water entering the cell. They have a special structure called the contractile vacuole that can squeeze excess water out of the cell. It works in much the same way that a pump removes water from inside of a boat. We've made it to the last page. So page 74, packages of destruction. What causes most of the cells of a caterpillar to dissolve into ooze inside a cocoon? What causes the tail of a tadpole to shrink and then disappear? Lysosomes, that's what. Lysosomes are special vesicles in animal cells that contain enzymes. When a cell engulfs a particle and encloses it in a vesicle, lysosomes bump into these vesicles and pour enzymes into them. This is illustrated in figure 28. The particles in the vesicles are digested by the enzymes. Lysosomes destroy worn out or damaged organelles. They also get rid of waste materials and protect the cell from foreign invaders. Sometimes lysosome membranes break and the enzymes spill into the cytoplasm, killing the cell. This is what must happen for a tadpole to become a frog. Lysosome causes cells in a tadpole's tail to die and dissolve as a tadpole becomes a frog. Lysosome played a similar role in your development. Before you were born, lysosome caused the destruction of the cells that form the webbing between your fingers. Lysosome destruction of cells may also be the factors that contribute to the aging process in humans. So down on the bottom, you have those eight organelles and their functions. So you have the nucleus, which contains the cell's DNA and is a control center of the cell. You have the ribosomes, the site where amino acids are hooked together to make proteins. You have the endoplasmic reticulum, which makes lipids, breaks down drugs and other substances, packages up proteins for release from the cell. You have the mitochondria, which break down food molecules to make ATP, powerhouse of the cell. Chloroplasts, which make food energy using the energy of sunlight. Golgi complex, which processes and transports materials out of the cell. The vacuole, which stores water and other materials. And then the lysosomes, which digest food particles, waste, cell parts, and foreign invaders. Page 75. Plant or animal. 
How can you tell the difference between a plant cell and an animal cell? They both have a membrane, and they both have nuclei, ribosomes, mitochondria, endoplasmic reticula, Golgi complexes, and lysosomes. But plant cells have things that animal cells do not have, a cell wall, chloroplast, and a large vacuole. You can see the differences between plant and animal cells in figure 29. Okay, your last review questions. One, how does the nucleus control the cell's activities? Two, which of the following would not be found in an animal cell? Mitochondria, cell wall, chloroplast, ribosome, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi complex, large vacuole, DNA, chlorophyll. Three, use the following words in a sentence. Oxygen, ATP, breathing, and mitochondria. And four, applying concepts. You have the job of giving new names to different things in a city. The new names have to be parts of a eukaryotic cell. Write down some things you would see in a city. Assign the name of a cell part that is most appropriate to their function. Explain your choices. For example, the Golgi complex processes and transports, transports materials out of the cell. I would probably call that the post office. It's just a hint for you. Okay, guys, it's been fun reading for you. Um, I hope you all do great on this. If you have any questions at all, if you're my student, contact me. If you're Mr. MP student, you can contact him. If you're Mrs. Flat students, you can contact her. So let us know if you guys have any questions, okay?